the gallery director uh, uh, here in the gallery, which is redundant, so hey. Um, I'm really excited and proud to have Philip A. Robinson Jr. here talking about, <laughs> talking about the show, uh, this exhibition, which is Old Talks with New Icons. Um, I hope you have brought many questions to ask him um, as we go through, uh, as he goes through the exit, uh, the artist talk. Um, and uh, don't forget, so obviously this will go to about 1.45 today. Um, he'll, he'll do his thing and then we'll have some questions. But then tonight we have the closing reception uh, for the show. So if you'd like to come get a closer look at the artwork, talk to Phil, um, have some conversations, and you always know we got snacks. Um, I've been that over at students, snacks are important. Um, so please come join us tonight um, and have some fun. So, uh, Philip A. Robinson Jr. is an award-winning multimedia sculptor and conceptual artist who uses wood to symbolize, symbolize temporality within natural cycles of time and geography to amplify the narrative identity within popular and marginalized cultures. Uh, Robinson has exhibited throughout the tri-state area, including a solo exhibition at Highline 9, solo exhibition at Untitled Space Gallery, Prism Art Fair during the Miami Art Basel, Rush Arts Gallery, KL City, Art Gallery in Malaysia, Lululemon, the National Academy of Museum, National Academy of Museum and School, the Barrett Art Center, which is actually where I first came across Phil's work, um, the Francis Young Tame Museum and Art Gallery, Art at the Caves, 14C Jersey City Art Show and Jury Exhibition, the Bronx Art Space, the Novato Gallery, the Bridge Art Gallery. Um, I'm, should I want me to keep going? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Needless to say, we are incredibly pleased to have Phil here with us, and I'm so excited to have him talk with you. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Morning. <laughs> Good to be here. Good to see you all. If you want to come and have a seat, please feel free. We have some room. If you want to take one of these chairs, we can bring a chair for you. Up to you, or you can stay. And there's some chairs in the back. Absolutely. We have about, what, 47, 46 seconds to go from that, so we'll move on from there. But I will be, after lunch, because I do want to grab some lunch after this, yeah. but I will be coming into the life drawing class to do some life drawing. So if anyone's doing some drawing later on, I'll be in there. I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get down dirty with all of you guys <laughs> in the studio, so that's going to be fun. Uh, we're going to wait for this to start in a couple of minutes. Um, one of the other things that's currently up right now, if you are traveling to... Portland, which is where I currently reside, uh, there is an exhibition up at the Portland airport that just went up. Um, it is four uh, large-scale sculptures, the largest one being 70 by 70 inches, um, all wood and metal. And that work will be up for six months, um, as well as a short animation that will also be available. So. Before you all leave, please, you can start following me on Instagram if you want to, or we can change information, and I can let you know and put you on the emailing list for those works as well. All right. Good. However, where are we? There it is. And I have linked to uh, Phil's Instagram um, on the DCC of Visual Arts Instagram. So if you forget, you can go right on there. That's all right. We're going to get started. I'm going to pull it up on my computer until our computer says, you know what, I'm ready. And then we shall go. All right, so, afternoon. Um, the name is Philip A. Robinson, Jr. I am an athlete, a father, an educator, and a working artist. During this presentation, I intend to show you and talk to you in depth about my artistic practice and curated selection of my art. 
My artistic practice encapsulates my experiences, expressions, conceptions, and realities as a black man of color living and working by coastal from New York to Portland, Oregon. My hope is that each one of you here today can take away one nugget of information that will enrich your own artistic practice. However, within the next 20 minutes, if you're sitting or standing in this room and nothing grabs you, just remember this. Find your passion, your mission. Remember to always respect and honor your gifts. Representation is the key that unlocks all doors. Your passion, your mission, to always respect and honor your gifts, because make no mistake about it, each and every one of you in this room has a gift. But how you choose to represent it is the key to unlocking your Back in the 11th grade, I came to the realization that I was an artist. The 11th grade, mind you. I was the student who would make a ceramic sculpture for history class, or I'd look through diorama for English. But it wasn't until the 11th grade that I was comfortable calling myself an artist. Now, this was no small task, as I did not come from a long line of established artists. No, my lineage was quite different. I have two half-brothers, and I'll show you quickly. That's me playing soccer way back when, when I used to have some hair, right? <laughs> this is my daughter, Vivian James. She's currently three years old. She's with mommy right now back in Portland. This is my ceramics class back at uh, Catlin Gable, where I currently teach. This is me working on that series in Portland for the airport. And these are my two brothers. One, the entertainment lawyer, and the other, the anesthesiologist. The anesthesiologist, however, uh, lives in St. Thomas and sends us pictures of him on his deck enjoying the sunset every day. We don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> My father is an electrician who started his own business in New York City back in the 1980s. And his father, my grandfather, was a retired Supreme Justice for New York State. This is my grandfather my father, and his twin brother. My mother was a doctor of sociology and a dean of students at Sarah Lawrence College. So when little Philip Jr. came and said he was going to be an artist, there was not that much enthusiasm. Except from my mother, the educated. She took it upon herself to personally nurture and my talents and find ways to pursue my gifts. Looking back at it, it was something she had always done. The child who loved going to the pet store four times a week, who had 26 animals living in his home. You could ask me about those animals when I see you later on. The six foot two curly haired black boy growing up in the 80s who chose to play soccer instead of basketball. But don't test me, I can still get you on the basketball court as well. I was enrolled in sleepaway camp uh, that summer called the Putney School. It was a life-changing experience. I was able to work with materials I had never encountered before, clay, wood, metal, and converse with like-minded creatives about style and form. I returned from my senior year to Teaneck High School, New Jersey, with a newly lit fire underneath me. Ah, there we go, perfect. Thank you. And in the year 2001, I created and exhibited my first series, applied and when accepted early decision to Skidmore College and found out that my mother had terminal cancer. Slack. My mother lived to see me walk across that stage to receive my diploma from Skidmore College in the spring of 2005. As she said to many family and friends, it was one of the greatest accomplishments of her life. She would pass that winter in the year 2006. Dr. Regina A. R. I often remember my conversations between my mother and I, but this one I will share with you took place soon after I graduated undergrad. I asked her if I was good enough. Am I good enough to make it as an artist? Do I have what it takes? Is my art good enough? She looked back at me with a chair and spoke, 
I could answer this question as someone who has been to countless museums and galleries and seen decades of art. I could answer this as the educator, the dean, who talks to like-minded students every day, engaging their talents and gifts. Or I could answer your question as the most important job of all, your mother. The reality is it doesn't matter what I believe. The only thing that matters is what you believe. If you don't believe that you indeed have what it takes, you will fail. So, what are you prepared to do? Slide. My mother was not physically present when I graduated from Mason Girls School of the Arts with my master's in 2008, but she was there. Slide. She was not physically present when I exhibited my artwork at all of the places of which Lindsay had just said. But she was there. She knew. Slide. Even today, her voice can be found within each series I produce, such as Slap. Untie the Faces, which none are in here in this room, but I'll talk a little bit about that. Un the series Untitled Faces depicts individuals we see in today's multifaceted media, TV, film, print, web. These figures have been abstracted within the positive and negative space to engage the viewer and allow for individual interpretation. I'll let you read through all of that, but all of that gives you slide images that look like this. Now this is made from all metal and wood. None of the wood has been tinted. The wood that you see here, especially if you're looking towards those lips, that is red heart. There are three types of hearts. There's red heart, purple heart, and yellow heart types of woods. The hair is metal, all sheet metal cut from hand, same thing with the eyebrows. As you saw in the uh, picture of me playing soccer back at Skidmore days, I used to have long hair, but one of the issues with me is people would want to come and touch my hair constantly. What you have with this, if you were to go and touch this hair, you would cut yourself. Purposely done. Slide. Same thing with this. I think for a lot of us, especially for me in teaching, uh, you get a lot of these narratives about students and about younger generations and how we are just not in the know. We don't know what's going on. We're on too much technology. We're playing too much. And yet, we are the pulse of what's really going on in our society. We know what's happening. And so here you have these headphones of the child, and yet you have the emblem of the United States Christ. Slide, please. All of these images and all of these figures are from individuals that we can interpret through our known interpretation. They are celebrities we've seen in the film and print. Some are more identifiable than others. Uh, but again, this idea of being able to see something and interpret yourself in these individuals. Slide, please. What has been can never be undone. I'm going to want to read through that. But what that is in the series of original sketches is on this back wall here to the left was about the racist imagery that Gucci, Prada, and Montclair put out in their clothing lines. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but if you're not, Gucci, Prada, and Montclair put out different entities in their clothing lines. Slide, I'll show you what I mean. This one here from the Montclair of the black face with red lips. The sweater, the turtleneck of the black face with red lips. The manly figures, right? And so you have to ask yourself, well, how many eyes, how many hands had to go to approve this before it was done? It's just not put out, right? People had to approve of this. And so why is this imagery allowed? And so the piece of the slide that you'll see here have that image of the symbol in the backs of all the figures. You can see here you have the rooster and the M for Montclair slide the triangle for the Prada logo, slide, and the two Gs for the Gucci logo. Within each one of these pieces, you have the emblems, but it's not ready identifiable. You have to walk up the piece to view it. And while you're walking up to that piece, as you can see with some of these other pieces here with the mirror, fin excuse me, mirror finished stainless steel, you see yourself in the reflection of those pieces. Now, why is that important? It's important because you want to be able to see yourself in the figure but also we know that racism in this country is not identifiable, right? 
sometimes it's really ingrained in what we deal with every day. And so being able to try and figure out and try and see yourself within all these cracks and crevices, I think is important. Slide. And all talks with new icons, which you can see here with the images that we have and sculptures around the room. Clothing affects how other people perceive us as well as how we think about ourselves. To see the promise of a better self reflected in the object is to imagine a better future. Clothing is not only universal, it is non-binary. Designers and fabric pictures pull their inspiration from multiple cultures, demographics, environments, and elements. But depending on where you grew up, your culture, your religion, you may not have been introduced to a certain type of cloth, material, or attire. These sculptures will allow the viewer to envision or reinvent themselves. They will serve as a conduit to the past as well as the future. The clothed figure devoid of flesh is affixed to highly polished stainless steel. The figure appears suspended between the physical space and its reflection. Although the figure is fixed, its situation is contingent on where the work is placed and the viewer's chance reflection in it. As such, the work is available for continuous happiness said by the artist Pistoletto, who also worked in mirror finish stainless steel, except he paints on his mirror finish versus me. The viewer and sculpture subject are both in the same situation. Neither can impose their will on each other. So the idea of you being able to walk up and physically and mentally put yourself into the face and figure of these figures we see here. So. Can you click on this? This should be, yeah, there you go, thank you. You may not have ever seen yourself in a kimono. You may not have seen yourself in a pair of Timberlands. Growing up here on the East Coast, if you were growing up, you had a pair of Timberlands on in the wintertime, you had a pair of Air Force Ones in the summertime, right? But that may not have been your upbringing. And so for me, it's important that people can really see themselves in what it would look like, right? You may not be able to afford a Tom Ford suit, but you want to see what you look like in that space. It's like this. And so here's another image of actually seeing yourself represented in these pieces. This piece was in a collector's home. Uh, actually, I want to take a look. Slide. 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 interesting note, I'll go back for a minute, interesting note of this piece from a uh, like-minded artist perspective is this piece was purchased by the Rockefeller Foundation, if anyone knows the Rockefellers, uh, which is amazing. It's very excited for that. But the other component of that, which you'll find out as artists, is that sometimes you cannot promote that, right? And so within their clause of the Rockefellers, being the Rockefellers, you cannot use their likeness on anything. And that's the business side of it. So even though this piece was versus, I cannot show it on Instagram. So I can share it with you, but I can't post it, right? Things to think about and kind of doors that we as artists come up against that you have these amazing things, but you can't share them when knowing that it would help you further your own practice. So. My mother saw my potential, my gifts, long before I did. And if you take a moment, I'm sure you can recall one or two individuals from your past or present. A family member, a friend, a teacher, a role model who played or is playing a pivotal part in helping you be where you are today. They may have helped or opened that door, but ultimately, ultimately, excuse me, it is up to you to find your own passion, your mission, and 
gives and pass that down that information to the next generation as that is your legacy, your representation. No matter how long it takes, and trust me, sometimes it does not happen in high school or undergrad or graduate school or your first, second, or third job career change. Sometimes it takes years for us to understand which path we're meant to follow. Just remember, you can't miss someone else's boat. The question is, what are you doing to prepare for where your boat comes in? Make no mistake, the path is long and hard. It's not easy. You will face adversity. You will be told no more than you want. You will struggle. You will encounter loss. You will endure heartache. And there will be times when it's just too much and you will need to stop. You nor I can prevent this. However, in this moment, remember to ask yourself one question. Have I done enough? Have I done all I can do? If I stop now, would I be content with my efforts or do I have a little bit more? Remember, it only gets better when you get better. So, apply for that exhibition, residency, or a creative job. Walk into that gallery you want to exhibit with confidence. Build your network, own your business, live your dream. But when the crowds fade, and it's you alone in that studio, or in front of that blank computer screen, or in that classroom, or walking to that job interview, remember to find your passion, your mission, honor your gifts. Because if you do, you shall never work a day in your life. And if I have your attention, know this, you are already on that path. And I can't wait to see where you go. So go represent. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>And you want to open it up for questions. And again, I'll be here for most of the day. So if you're still thinking of things that you want to ask, feel free. But I'll sit down with you and we can talk about some of these works or any other questions that you may have. I'm going to leave the computer at home just for a half a plate. <laughs> <laughs> questions, folks? Uh, so for each of your, like, We'll talk from the Nikon series. Are these, I guess the best way I can word this question is, are these concepts or are these are these like specific people that you know that you're portraying or are these ideals of archetypes? Both. I would say both. Um, the individuals are all from print, television, and film. Individuals that we would see in our conscious mind every day or in some realm of social media, or at some point in time, right? But they're distorted so that you can only see yourself in that image while still trying to interpret who you think and where you've seen this image before. Uh, they are stances and poses that, again, have been used over and over again by our socials, right? So being able to see that, we start to try and interpret who we think it is while also seeing ourselves reflected in the mirror image. This is family time, so no raise hands. If you have a question, please answer. Yes. Well, I was wondering about your process for the Other Faces series. Yeah. So, like, how did you get to create like the hair in both of them while also like not being able to touch it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, same thing with the wood. You know, you you can't force something to be what it's not, right? And so sometimes. I have to just amass a certain amount of material in my studio before I can start to make it. And usually what happens is if I start having ideas, things will kind of start to snowball, right? And I'll start to see how I can utilize this or how this piece of wood can be used. Or, you know, I think about an idea of how I want to conceptualize the hair and how I want that to look and where am I going to source it. So a lot of it is building relationships with, you know, 
businesses that are within my area and building friendships, friendships with them. Because once you do that, then you wind up not even paying for certain things, right? I'm at a point now where people know I love working in wood, so they're like, Phil, Phil, I got this piece of wood, man. You want to use it? You can, can you use it? I'm like, uh, it's not really kiln dried. It's, it's warped. I don't know if I use that, but I appreciate the offer. Or, you know, the metal that you saw in the hair. Uh, again, that was just available. You know, uh, it was from a uh, automobile rim shop where they cut rims out, so you have all these shavings left over. And I just went to them and said, "Look, I got this idea. Can I can I use these pieces?" They're like, "You want these?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me get them." Take it to them, but then I always go back and show them the work also, right? Because I think that's important to help tie that circle together because another artist may come to them and ask them for something as well. And so then they'd be more open to sharing. Yeah. Yes? I think you mentioned before that none of your wood gets painted, right? It's all a natural color of the wood. Is there any treatment that you do use on the wood as you're working with it? Or is it all just sort of in its bare, raw state. Yeah. Time is important. So if you look up my practice, I use dental chronology to date all of my wood. So dental chronology basically is the dating of wood, and we know that from childbirth, right? That you count the rings on the wood to give you how old a piece is. So, for example, can you do me a favor? Can you count the rings on the top portion of that, the wall that right there? How many rings do you see on that piece? Uh, 25. Like the rings, like the ones that have spiral down? Maybe? Yeah. 25, 26. Sweet. How old are you? 26. <laughs> So that piece was born when you were. So now, what does that mean? Right. Well, we talk about what happened in your life. It's the same thing that happened to this tree before it was repurposed to be this image. Now, if you talk about a piece that was 100, 200 years old, then you're talking about a historic timeline between what has happened then and so now. So if you're talking about a piece that is 200 years old, you're talking about equal rights, women's rights, gender rights, you're talking about slavery and apartheid. All of these things happen during the timeline of this wood. And if you know the wood was sourced in either upstate New York, which a lot of this piece was, Woodstock area, then you can pinpoint the time it was happening during that time place. Right? Which is important to me because I am a quarter Cherokee. So my ancestors were here, right? sourcing this wood, using it for building homes or materials or utensils or bulbs or trading. A lot of hardwood is very expensive, so that would have been used for trading and making money, stuff like that, well signifiers. So that's very important to the work as well. In terms of treating the wood, why I mentioned the time aspect of it is I want these pieces to stand the test of time. Each of these pieces is hand screwed in from the back, right? So no one can take this and just take a piece off. It's also important that these pieces, in terms of the wood, if you know wood, wood is always alive, right? Chemically. So if you don't treat the wood, the wood eventually will cork and start to rot and then fall. So what I do is I use a process of uh, thirds, which is polyurethane, tongue oil, and um, polyurethane, tongue oil, and mineral spirits third of each, mix that up, and then I apply that to the works, right? Do about three layers on each piece, and then you want to use wool steel, excuse me, wool steel, to burnish it, which helps to solidify the chemicals and particles in the wood, and then go back over it. And if you do that on a couple of layers, you can get that quality in the wood that if you were to touch it, it feels like glass to the touch. This also is great because then the wood will never rot, the wood will never fold. These pieces will always be around unless you take them and you burn them. They will be here forever. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, what's your favorite piece that you've made so far? The one I'm working on now. It's <laughs> <laughs> so always the next one. It's so always the next one. Because especially with the works, you know, I'll ask you this, is a piece ever finished? No, you can always add more. That's right, you can always go back to it, right? So that means that I may be looking at it, I'm talking to you and I'm like, I think it's missing something, so I can go back and change it, it's mine, I own it. 
So the same thing with these works, that I'm, I'm expressing ideas, I'm getting to a certain point, but now these is the jumping point for the next works. And then those works are the jumping point for the one following that as well. Uh, if we were on LinkedIn to think, I would show you uh, some of the other series, but I, I'll show you an image of what some of those other works look like uh, later on that are actually up at the Portland Museum. And you can kind of see the maturation of where these were to where I am currently in those works as well. Yes? What are the cars? I don't remember being the cars touched on in the presentation. Can you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. <laughs> so all of the works on paper, um, these are how I do my sketches. So I start off with paper and I sketch it out and I cut it out because I'm interested in the negative and positive space. So all the works on paper you see here are either works that have been done or works that I'm still thinking about that I still have yet to produce. So these are my sketches, individual sketches that I put up for people to see. The cars you see here was my first car, that was my mom's car that eventually became mine, it was an 87 Honda Civic that eventually when I took it to college, decided that if it rained, it would mess up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I put it up there as a reminder in terms of, uh, you know, not only my mother, but also where I came from and all the many you know, experiences I've had in that car. I used to call that car White Dynasty. It was, uh, it was an amazing car, love that car. But I have yet to figure out how I want to utilize that imagery in my work. And part of it is I just haven't found the materials yet. It hasn't hit me. So, you know, I've got hundreds of these sketches. These are just a few that I have up here um, that I've created that I'm constantly thinking about how I want to utilize for the next piece. Yes, sir. Um, which uh, artists and artistic movements would you consider yourself uh, most inspired by? That's a good question. Um, I was asked in graduate school, which artist I love the most, or which artist I saw myself in. And I didn't have an answer to that press because uh, at the time, when social media was still just booming, really starting into it, there was no way for you to see artists that looked like me that were creating the type of work that I wanted to see, right? And so you go to Gagosian, which now just picked up Derek Adams, who was a friend of mine. You've seen that information, which is a big deal. I'll go back to that in a minute. But if you look at uh, Guggenheim, you look at the Met, you look at a lot of these major institutions, they did not have individuals that looked like me creating work that I wanted to see. Right? And so it was important for me to kind of build a network of artists that I love, a lot of which I can name all names for you that you probably would not know. Maybe some of you would. Derek Adams, Yashua Close, Abigail DeVille, Hank Willis Thomas, who just put up the uh, new sculpture of the Martin Luther King, the embrace that he calls it. Um, Yashua Close, Latoya Ruby Frazier, Juan Ortiz, these are all of my friends that we grew up you know, making work at the same time that we now look towards, look to for inspiration and see what's going on and what things that they are working on. Uh, Amy Sherald, um, and even now, um, Kennedy Yanko, uh, who I love her work. She does these paint skins on uh, metal, which I'm really interested in what she's working on. She actually just has a show that's currently up in the city that I'm trying to go check out before I go back. Yes. Partial question, partial statements. We talked a little bit about this before, but you also draw a lot of inspiration from like 80s pop culture. I'm looking behind you and I'm seeing the Transformers, um, the Winnie the Pooh with the two <coughs> there. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Which goes back to your question. <coughs> Excuse me, which was representation. And why is representation important? And growing up in the 80s, in the 80s cartoons from the 90s, there was no representation of a black boy of color in cartoons. But I love these cartoons, and these cartoons were representation for me. So B.A. Baracus and his band in the A team was super important for me. Uh, Raphael from Ninja Turtles, well, you think, well, Raphael from Ninja Turtles, let me explain. Got into a huge argument with his family, left his family. Huge argument with his father. I grew up in the same parent home. 
left his family, had to really find himself and came back. That was really important for me growing up uh, in a single parent home. You have the Black Panther from Voltron, another super important piece. You have Akira, um, and then actually, if you notice this one, Akira has on Timberlands here in this piece. Uh, but that was super important for me as well. So all of these entities, you know, played a huge role. Panthro from Thundercats, another one, right? His tank, loving the tank, right? Wish I could drive that today. Um, but all of these, and even, there it is, Woody the Pooh on that side, again, with the Timberlands on. Um, that one, I'm still working on realizing that as a three-dimensional sculpture in the actual image he's holding onto a dollar bill uh, where well, he's wearing the two of that. So uh, being able to use these images and kind of where my mind was going to when I was growing up and realizing the importance of that to me now uh, and how they really play, played a pivotal role in my upbringing. Yes? I have another more process question, but how do you get such body cuts in paper? What, how, how do you do that, basically? Yeah. Um, when my mother passed, I was working for Pearl Paints as a custom framer. Uh, Pearl Paints, before Dick Blick came around, uh, was a huge art supply store that ran out of money. It was no longer exist, right? Um, but I was trying to figure out what I could do. And I luckily got into graduate school and then graduated. I no longer had a plasma cutter, which was I was using to cut uh, metal, which is actually the piece on the back side. Um, I didn't have any of the tools. I didn't have a studio. I had nothing. The only thing I did have was a house that I grew up in that I was struggling to pay the mortgage on, which was really expensive for someone who just turned 22, right? Um, so I had to figure out how to utilize what I could to get whatever I wanted. And that was going to Home Depot and getting a $20 tool that I could use in my own home. So if you had come to my house, you would see dust everywhere because I was cutting and doing things. And it really took about you know, 15 years of working in wood and working in paper to realize my vision of what I wanted to create. And in doing that during that time, turning myself into a machine. Uh, I didn't have the money to afford a lot of the CNC machines that we have now or the plasma cutters, so I had to turn myself into that machine of being able to have a steady hand. And so the cutout see here is all with an exacto uh, with paper, and then backed with walnut, and then put in a walnut frame. So when I cut out the negative positive space, I can see how I could utilize that in the wood aspect of it, because I blow these pieces up and then cut it out in wood, all hand cut by hand as well, because I just don't have the money any other way, you know? So, being able to put some music on, I'm a big music person, big R&B person, uh, put the music on and just go at it, you know, four or five hours a day, which can be hard, it can be exhausting because when you're going to school, come home, I have my daughter who wants my time, actually deserves my time, so I try and spend as much time with her as I can, with my wife, and then before I go to bed, three to four hours in the studio. It's a must, you have to. Uh, I think, and Lindsay will assess to this, you know, there are times in which we just get really frustrated with ourselves. Like we're angry, we're annoyed, people are talking to us, but I don't want to be bothered right now, I'm not doing this. And when you think about why your attitude has shifted, a lot of the times it's because we're, we have stopped doing what we're meant to do. Right? We stopped doing the art, the creative side. We need this creative outlet. I tell people all the time, if I can sing, I'd be a singer. I can't sing. <laughs> I will never be an art singer, even with auto right? But I can express my thoughts and my feelings through mediums. And the medium that I currently choose is wood. And yes? Actually, two questions. Yeah. Um, the first, um, is there a deeper significance to your choice of walnut um, for all of your sketches? Um, and second, actually, that has to do with your daughter, if you're only asking, I'm a mom. And so does your daughter ever work alongside you? Like, do you ever do projects together, get her involved in, in the making of, you know, art in your studio? Yeah. So, um, I use walnut, I love walnut. Um, it's another hard wood, and so at times it can be very hard to work with, but I love the wood grain in a lot of it. There's also different types of walnut. 
Um, there is only one tree in this world. No two trees are alike. It's the same thing for humans, kind of going back to the genomes of humans. So if you know that and you're looking at walnut, and you've seen all different brands, different colors and things, it really draws to me. So I love working with that. Uh, in terms of my daughter, the educator side, I don't want to push art on her. Um, I want her to choose what she wants, but she loves working with me, uh, not when I'm cooking or if I'm in the studio. So, uh, you know, I take her with me to places. She's come with me to school, so she's worked with my students uh, when we're creating stuff in ceramics. She does love to paint on her own. She does love to color on her own. Um, I usually take her to it. She would have been here, but it's just too expensive to fly. But I try mm -hmm. to take her to you know, all of my exhibitions and showings and let her know what's going on so that she can be in the know and know that her father is an artist. Right? But she'll have the choice of doing whatever she wants to pursue. As it should be. As it should be. That's right. She's currently in ballet right now. Um, and Portland. Um, has a coming from New York and coming to moving to Portland for work was hard in our family because there's a huge lack of diversity in Portland. Um, so she's really only she was one of three um, ballerinas of color in that system, and so that was hard at first. But she's really coming into her own. So we call them the three of them, which are all friends. We call them the uh, what is it? We we say the. Uh, what do we call it? Something ballerina. It'll come to me, but, but it's, uh, I'll show you a picture. But ballerina, and now she's doing soccer, she likes, and basketball. Keep them busy. Keep them busy. <laughs> yes. I have a question. So can, you just mentioned moving, which uh, to me as an artist, there's so much, so much importance in that community that you have to keep making it as an artist, other artists who give you great feedback, or even you talk about the community where you found your metal. Like, um, how does how does that translate for you? I think it's a, a personal question, but as you moved, like, how did you reestablish that community? How did you find that? I want to answer that. I also know what it's like to sit down in a chair for a long period of time. So if you need to stand up for a minute to stretch and do what you need to do, I will not take offense. Right? Okay. Do that. It's okay. Um, it was extremely hard moving from the Tri-State area to Portland. We moved because my wife works for Nike. And so during the pandemic, she got a call for her dream job to move. And so we had to make the conscious decision if we were gonna to move to family or not. And I told her, I said, you know, I can make my artwork anywhere. I can teach anywhere, it's not a problem for me. My ceiling is my artwork, it's not my teaching. You know, my ceiling is excelling in my, my practice. Your love and your dream job is at your doorstep, so who am I to say to block you from doing what you want to do? And so we made a decision that we would move, which was hard for us. Um, it was not easy. At the time which we moved, I had really advanced uh, in terms of my work. A gallery, the Untitled Space Gallery, had just given me my first solo show uh, in Soho. Uh, people were itching to, to get to the work, to have studio visits, all that kind of stuff, and here I was picking up all my stuff and moving. So I had to ask myself, you know, well, what is the purpose of me moving? I know why I'm moving with my wife. Why, why am I, what is my purpose? And it's really taken about a year and a half to understand what my purpose was, or I should say is, in Portland. You know, I'm bringing what I'm giving to Portland and also making an impact to the students that I talk with and deal with every day. Um, and being a black man uh, in a predominantly white institution, Captain Gable is important. That was a reason for that why I'm there as well. And to build connections. So to answer your question, you know, it was a, I could tell, I could tell you exactly what it was. It was a rainy February day. In Portland, it rains all the time. Right? <laughs> all the time. It's gray, it's cold, people are angry, upset, happy, walking around in gloom. And I was in one of those days where I was pissed off. I'm like, I had all this stuff going for me in New York. I'm not doing anything here. People don't know me. What am I going to do? And I said, you know what? Shut up. Go do what you're supposed to do. And start knocking on doors. Right? Do like you used to do. Start, go cold call like you used to do. Get back on the ground. So I took my portfolio, dressed up, 
and I went and would knock on gathering doors. Went to three of them, said I was going to do three of them in one day. Went to one, you're like, oh, we're not really looking for anybody, we're not interested in your work, so, all right, fine. Went to the second. Oh, no, no, we're thinking about getting, so we can't do sculptures, uh, all right, fine. Go to the third. Third one, I go in, so I have a conversation with the curator. She's like, I think my husband follows <laughs> I said, what? I said, yeah. I said, what's his name? He said, Red Ray. I said, I know Red Ray. Started talking some more. They're from Newark, which is close from where I was in Jersey City, right? We have all the same concepts, all the same friends. Come talk to the owner of the gallery. Start talking to her, right? Building that rapport again, give me more confidence, right? And then from there, start talking to more people. Start talking to the people at the airport. Right? Start talking to other galleries, more curators building networks at Nike, doing all these things. Uh, I'm currently on the Beaverton Arts Council. Uh, we just had a walkthrough for all of the artwork at Nike's campus, which is in Beaverton. Uh, the show that's up at the airport is up, working with animators, doing animation, sending that off. So things are finally starting to move, but it was not until, you know, you just gotta get mad. You gotta get mad. <laughs> and you gotta say, you know what? This ain't it. You know, this ain't it. I'm meant for more. But what are you going to do about it, right? You're going to sit here, you're going to assault, you're going to stay in your own situ your situation, or are you going to get up and do something about it? So that was the point. I said, I'm going to get up and start making those same connections that I built here. If I'm going to be a bi-coastal artist, i got to get up and do the work. And then I have a show here at Duchess Community College as well. If I can, do you mind if I add on something really quick? Um, also on to that, I mean, like I said, I saw Phil's work at a show we were both in. And that's the importance of, you know, going to openings. I saw him interact and talk with people and you, I haven't even said this to you yet, I saw your daughter and she was so excited and you don't know who's at your shows, right? You don't, and I was just really impressed and I was like, ah. Oh, he would be, you would be great here, and you are. And the show is so amazing. Um, and it's, but also going out and finding those opportunities, even if you're not an artist at the exhibition, and making those connections is such a vital part of being an artist. So I'm in a teacher mode there for a second. No, no. <laughs> like adding up, like yes, this is what you do. Um, we think the, the art world is so big. It's not. It's not big, right? Same thing in New York City. We think New York City is so big. And you can be walking on the street and you're going to see somebody you know. It happens to you nonstop because it's not so big. So when you go to a show that you're interested in, you're going to see somebody you know. It's the same people that go to the same shows and the same conversations. And they keep seeing your face and we're going to know, well, who is that? What do they do? I'm interested in them. And then you start talking. You start building your networks. And you say, look, i got this new series I'm trying to promote. You have a show coming up. Maybe not now, but maybe something in the future, right? Apply for those residencies. Apply for shows. You may think because you didn't get it, that's the end, right? It's not because someone took a look at your work. They saw it. They now know your name, which is attached to your work. So now when you keep going, eventually they'll say, oh yeah, I've seen their work before. I think we should put them in, put them in the show. They'd be good, right? You just gotta keep keep going. You know, and I hate it when people say, oh, people are gonna say no. You gotta get turned down a hundred times. You don't have to get turned down a hundred times, but you're gonna get turned down. You're going to, people are gonna say no to you. And you gotta be able to accept that as the criticism, right? People are not saying they don't like the work, but maybe the other person who got in other than you had an in some way, right? So how can you get that in? How can you be that person that people are like, you need to see my work, right? Somebody says no to you, that's cool. Maybe you're not the person I need to talk to because I know my work is important. Teach a little bit. Mm. <laughs> Teach a little bit. Are there any other questions that people have? I have one more. Okay. About how long would it take you? You said you're, you know, you're turning into a cutting machine, right? About how long would it take you to do a sketch? I mean, obviously, you can't do one straight one. Like, maybe one on one, one you. Like, how many hours of work is that process? When I first started the idea, and actually, the one I showed you of picking up that uh, kimono and putting it back down, that I filmed it because that was my, like, aha moment, right? Of how I can see myself in something that I've never seen before. And so from there, I started making all the other sketches. So now, if I'm sitting down to make a sketch, it may take me like 15, 20 minutes. 
But before, when I was first starting, I had to conceptualize how it would look. It would take me about, you know, two hours, an hour, two hours, something like that. In terms of the work, when you saw the on top of faces, when I first started that, I had never seen that before. So I had no way of knowing how to do it. So that took me about a year, a year and a half to actually, from my conception to production to completion, to actually make it work. Now, my timeline is about two to three weeks, right, to actually, from conception to production to completion. Same thing with these pieces. And one thing that I'm constantly thinking about is sculptor versus painter, right? Where as painter, I could knock out a bunch of works within a week span, right? If I had the time. As a sculptor, I don't have that luxury because it's the material which is very expensive and then trying to conceptualize how to put it all together. And even though I've chopped my time down immensely, I'm also thinking about, you know, numbers lines. If from the business standpoint of it, if I only have this many pieces, it's not a lot of money coming in, right? And how am I selling those works? So from a dis business standpoint, I need to have something for everybody. What are my price points, right? This is the business side of it. If you're trying to sell your work, do you have a piece for somebody, right? Same thing for colleges, right? There is a college for everyone, right? So how do you have pieces that everyone, if someone wants a piece, someone can get your piece for $10, somebody can get your piece for 50 grand, right? Depends on what that value is. Um, so, you know, it, it's, I brought my time down in terms of how long it takes to complete work. But even now, and going back to you, which you're talking about in terms of like the new work now, I had never done that before, right? So I'll pull it up real quick so you can see that piece that was 70 by 70, um, I always work better under pressure. But that being said, I still know how long things take. So when I was doing that piece that was 70 by 70, it really meant that I was, um, I was really dedicating my time that I would spend almost, um, I, was, I was spending five, five hours a day for three months, um, more time on the weekends to produce this work. I don't have an image of it because um, it's still being done, but this is, a still from the film of that piece. And if you can kind of guess the size, it is currently 70 by 70 um, of that work. All day cut by hand. And I, when I, I can send you better images of it than you can. And I can show you guys the, this is the short animation, but this is kind of the, the piece for that. Uh, there's this one, I'll show you the other one. There's this one here. There's another one from that series. And then there is this one. Okay, the last one. So again, trying to, you know, constantly challenge myself, trying to, uh, you know, give myself a, a, a better way to look at things. When I got the show at the airport, my thought was, that's great. People haven't seen me in Portland yet. I'm just bringing the words from the East Coast over, bring all these pieces, it'd be done. It's cool. I'm running a Sprinter van, because it's too expensive to get somebody to do it. I'll do it myself, show it in, done. And the more and more I thought about it, the more I was like, you're doing a disservice to the space. You don't know anything about the space. So let's learn about the space. And in learning about the space, I learned that the airport was originally on indigenous land and it was taken. And the indigenous folk that lived there, it was like a center hub for trading, for talking, for communicating, and it was gone. And so when you're walking through Portland Airport, there is no representation of those that were there before them. And being a person of color and walking through the airport, I did not see myself in the airport at all. And so I said, 
I want people when they walk through this airport to see themselves represented in this space. I said, that's where I think it's Do you want me to just play it? Do you want to see it? Yeah. yeah. We'll play it? I'm sorry if it's small, um, but at least you'll be able to see it. And if you can't, feel free to close it. I will say briefly after this, because a lot of you have two o'clock classes, you will have to go. It's called Welcome In. I hope I see both of you later on today at the closing exhibition. And if you have any other questions, feel free to come up with us. Talk. All right. One quick thing before you all run off. Please grab your chair and another chair and take them back outside. Uh, put them on the rack. We say, you know, as you talk about, we love our maintenance staff. We don't want to make more work for them. So let's put it back on the rack. 
And if you have time to grab an extra chair, that's super helpful. Uh, and we'll see you at 5 o'clock.